Hello, hello, hello. Hello from the great California outdoors. It's nice to see everybody here. Welcome to another Thursday edition of VMR. And uh, this is the first time um, this is happening. And what do I mean by this? Um, I think we've we shared this kind of vibe on Twitter recently of the idea being that CP Solvers has been very uh, early trainee heavy. And throughout um, the legacy of CP Solvers, we've had many medical students and interns and maybe R2s who have um, commented on the value add for them. But only recently have we recognized just the sheer power of extending um, the community and really deeply involving people who are at their either later stages of training or officially attendings, uh, even if they deny it. Um, and today, you'll hear three voices. Mine will hopefully be minimal, uh, but two other very um, wise people are here, both of whom are um, now attending. Um, and our case discussant, Alex, today is discussing for the first time, uh, though he's facilitated a few. But um, if you don't know Alex, um, that probably means one of two things, that you're recently joining VMR. Um, no way. Oh, my gosh. Sorry, Alex. I have to cut this intro short for a brief interjection. Say hello to the legendary Dr. Kimberly Manning. Hello. <laughs> What's up? How's it going? <laughs> I'm in clinic. It's so good to see you. It's so good to see you too. Where are okay, you all? At, are you all in Cleveland or? What that? Oh no, I cannot carry on. No way. Are you in Cleveland with Yusuf, or are you both back in Atlanta? Or? Uh, Yusuf is back from Sidham. We're in clinic today, um, caring oh, for you. <laughs> Amazing. That's so, so cool. I've known, I, I of course, I've known that you two uh, spent a lot of time in clinic together. This is the first time I get to see it live in action. So <laughs> in action yeah. It's That's super right. exciting. That's right. That's right. Well, who, whomever is presenting today, I'm sure you're going to be amazing. So no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> it's Jas Bajwa. I can really, and Jas has been part of CP Solvers for such a long time. And I, and I was, I was alluding to the fact that if you haven't heard his name, um, that's probably probably for one of two reasons. One is that you're just joining VMR very, very recently and haven't been around very much, or that you picked up on Jass's style. Um, historically, he's been very gentle and quiet. And through some mild encouragement from the CP solvers, he's become the loudest voice in the group. <laughs> I, don't, I think Jass has shed his... Um, shy them and the shy side of his personality and replaced it with his brilliance and his humor and I'm so glad we're seeing that blossom and I'm sure that it'll be part a big part um, of the case today and um, the other person you'll hear is Alex who I, I think is it's incredible has a very very similar story the only reason you may not know Alex is again you're just joining us uh, recently or that you've just made note of the fact that he sits silently throughout VMR, occasionally drops just knowledge bombs in the chat um, and has really been um, the most ever president, uh, present resident uh, in the history of VMR. I think it is literally impossible to attend VMR as a resident as much as Alex has. And so we're thrilled that as long overdue um, that I get to uh, dance with these two fine uh, young attendings. And yes, you're both attendings. Don't tell me I'm just a chief or I'm only my first year. You're both attendings. And I'm really, really excited to uh, to share the stage with you. So I'll pass the mic to you, Alex, uh, to say hi, and then to Jas to say hi, and then jump right into the case. Thanks so much, Robbie, and thank you so much again for inviting me to come and 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 chat and discuss with you. I'm really excited for today. A little nervous for the the case that Jazz ha has in store for us, but more excited. Um, yeah, it's an honor. Um, I it's funny because like uh, it seems like based off Robbie's spiel that it seems like I've gotten more loud but Alex has stayed the same level keel <laughs> um, <Correct. laughs> um, it's an honor to present today and honestly what a pleasant surprise to see Dr. Kimberly Manning here um, and AMK so I think we have a rock star lineup um, we're gonna have probably plenty of pearls in the chat um, it's an honor and I, I'm very excited to present this case I don't think it's a too long of a case but like taught me so much and I'm like excited to share that teaching here today. Amazing. Well, we got Ashutosh in the, in the scribing seat and David's going to be doing teaching points. So take it away whenever you're ready, Jeff. All right. So I'm going to start off with the one liner for you guys to begin your discussion. So this is a 56 year old female 
that presents with four weeks of lethargy, irritability, headaches, brain fog, neuropathy in her lower extremities. And neuropathy, she mainly describes it as numbness and tingling. Well, what, what thoughts cross your mind? I guess it's a point of clarification, Jess. So the, the lethargy, irritability, brain fog, and, and neuropathy, hit, are those all over these four weeks, all over the same time course? Exactly. Um, if she, at this point in time, she's not able to identify one particular um, symptom that started before than the other. Perhaps the neuropathy was the last thing or the, the kind of the later one that she noticed, but that was the first thing that she noticed was lethargy, irritability, and brain fog. Got it. So I guess, I guess immediately what I'm doing is I'm, I'm jumping into the, uh, the, the schema that Dr. Berkowitz teaches us all the time about a, like a neurologic, I'm immediately thinking that we're probably in a neuro in the bucket of a neurologic diagnosis. And I'm thinking that uh, in terms of localization times time course, I, I don't have a good localization yet. I think that all of the symptoms that we've presented so far are, are really general, except for the, the symptoms of the possible neuropathy type symptoms. But I'm excited to learn a little bit later about what the specific symptoms are, whether they're sensory, whether they're motor, whether they're diffuse, whether they're localized. Um, and I'm thinking about how this has been going on in, in the subacute to chronic time course over the course of, uh, of about a month's time. So I'm thinking about the, I guess, combining that, uh, that schema with the, um, the missed mnemonic, I'm thinking about just about anything that could be causing this person to like a perturbance in his neurologic function. So I, I'm thinking first about things that could be happening out. And Robbie always does a good job of teaching us about thinking about what could be happening outside of the brain, causing this person neurologic dysfunction or, or inside of the brain. And I think for now, um, in this middle-aged person, I'm thinking more so about pathologies outside of the brain, although open to possibility of, of having a pathology inside the brain too. So I'm thinking about, um, like any, any, background medical history that we may learn about this patient to cue us into a possible metabolic disturbance. Uh, subacute to chronic time course, I'm thinking less about a about an infection, um, but possibly about like some type of toxic exposure or vitamin deficiency, depending on if we, <laughs> seeing now jump into the screen, uh, if we may, I'm wondering if we may hear about like a history of alcohol use disorder and, and potentially a thiamine deficiency. Um, and then I, that's what I'm thinking about in terms of toxic exposures or, or uh, like or toxic insufficiency and then, uh, or uh, mineral, vitamin or mineral insufficiency. And then in terms of structural lesions, I, I think I'm kind of putting that on the back burners and given that our symptoms seem to be so diffuse, um, but I still feel like we're pretty early. What do you think so far, Robbie? What have I missed? Yeah, yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I, I don't think you missed anything at all. I think that that analysis is superb. And I would just add that like, at the end of the day, um, you're gonna need a lot more information, but I think one working hypothesis to add is to, to uh, recognize the value of psychiatric symptoms in the context of a neurological presentation. And I think if you analyze that dimension of things, you might make some progress, although that progress has to be made with a lot of caution because the value, a localizing value of concomitant psychiatric symptoms is loose. But if you if you take everything that you said about the neurological analysis, which I agree with 100%, then you later ask the question, what does the irritability help us? And I think as a general rule of thumb, um, as a non-expert, as an internist analyzing neurological uh, symptoms from a distance, not with precision, I found two areas of localization of uh, concomitant psychiatric symptoms. The first is, I think, very well taught in medical school, which is frontal lobe issues. So frontal lobe disease reflects changes in personality, apathy, changes in mood, changes in motivation. And I've seen a patient with a frontal lobe meningioma who actually just presented with a change in his personality. So that's, a, that's a one place. And the other place is the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia uh, is a uh, as a set of structures, really not one specific structure. But uh, as a reminder of that association between psych and basal ganglia is um, the idea of many patients with Parkinson's disease having pre, uh, 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 before developing their motor symptoms, having um, uh, 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 having psychiatric symptoms, namely depression. So for me, I'm asking myself, does this patient have a problem in their, in their frontal lobe or in their basal ganglia? And it turns out that the basal ganglia is a place that frequently uh, overlaps with a lot of causes of neuropathy. So a lot of basal ganglia issues tend to feature um, neuropathy as a, um, as a concomitant presentation. And you named some great examples. So heavy metal toxicity, alcohol-related uh, vitamin deficiencies commonly feature the basal ganglia and the nerves. So 
what's actionable here is to realize that concomitant psychiatric symptoms in the face of neurological disease may be true, true, and unrelated, be unrelated, and may represent the difficulties of coping with the neurological illness in a pre-existing psychiatric condition. But if you're tr going to try to make some progress, none of, which, none of which you'll write in pen, you'll write in pencil, I am wondering now, is there something strategically in the frontal lobe or in the basal ganglia, which may be a systemic problem going to those areas or an in intrinsic uh, a neurological issue? All right, Jess, tell us more, please. Just, just amazing. Um, both Alex and Robbie, just you guys were, um, were on top of it from the very beginning. So I'm going to give you some more background history. Um, so <clears throat> this was four weeks of an ounce. And, and for the scribing team, if I'm speaking too fast, please let me know. So six weeks ago, so uh, she was having anorexia, progressive fatigue, and went to her PCP's office. Um, they checked the TSH. She does have history of hypothyroidism, and they checked the TSH, which was low. They increased the thyroxine dose. Although she said that she was taking her thyroxine adequately and, you know, uh, uh, did not have any issues with adherence. Then two weeks before presenting, so she's been having, so basically six weeks ago, I had that lethargy and fatigue. Then since four weeks, she's been having the continued lethargy, irritability, headaches, brain fog, neuropathy. And then two weeks before coming to the hospital, she had severe headaches, uh, ten, uh, tinnitus, numbness and tingling, and tingling are now in the upper extremity and lower extremity. And then one before one week before um, coming to the hospital, she started having progressive cognitive fog to the point where her partner is like, she's writing everything down um, that would basically normal act like uh, ADLs and stuff. Um, started having short-term memory loss, but still long-term memory was still intact. Um, also noticed that her anxiety was very heightened and had a little like maybe even senses of like paranoia. Um, and then also uh, uh, shortness of breath on exertions with palpitations. And then last but not least, unstable walking. She kind of felt like she did not trust herself um, walking by herself and needed either her husband's support or using like some type of uh, assisted devices. Um, do you guys want me to stop there? Or do you want me to give you the past medical history as well? Oh, I think there's a lot of good data here, Alex. What are you? What are you? Uh, what are you thinking about? Thank you, Jeff. So, thanks so much, Jeff. I think I'm I'm in a I'm in a pretty similar space to where we were before. So, just 100% uh, trying to clarify that time. So, I guess it was that we have this additional layer of two weeks before when they changed the. So four weeks ago was when she started noticing the majority of the symptoms, and two weeks before that, six weeks ago, was that when they changed the levothyroxine dose? Correct. Correct. So the day you're seeing her in the ED or hospital, it's been six weeks since her thyroid dose adjustment. Got it. So I guess the first question I have is why did they need to, if we had somebody who was presumably on a stable dose of levothyroxine, it's changed. It's strange for her all of a sudden to require a change in that, in that dose. I guess I'm thinking about, um, usually when I have somebody who doesn't have who has a like an aberrant TSH, especially if they've been on a levothyroxine dose for a long time, and wondering about um, like are they taking it at the right time? Even though she says she's taking it consistently, is she taking it in the morning before breakfast? And similarly, if she if she is still taking it at that time, I'm wondering if then there's any reason why she might not be absorbing it properly. Like the I think it was Noah mentioned a really good point in the chat about potentially celiac disease, which the or any other reason why she could not be she might not be absorbing the levothyroxine properly. Not to mention that celiac disease in and of itself could have um, its own neurologic manifestations. And, and I thought it was interesting to hear about the, these, um, these psychiatric symptoms of the, like the writing things over and over, and that she was, uh, um, the, and ultimately that we, that we found the, that she had, I think you mentioned difficulty walking or difficulty with balance. I guess that makes me, uh, again, I'm wondering about the, in terms of localization, I, I think that we're, we're seeing pathology that reflects potentially a variety of different parts of the of the central peripheral nervous system. I don't feel like I have a good localization yet in terms of the these psychiatric symptoms, writing things over and over and just not behaving like herself. I'm thinking like Robbie said more about like the frontal lobe and then the the lack of balance. I'm thinking cerebellum, I'm thinking peripheral nervous system. So I, I'm still kind of in the same 
space where I was when we discussed the first time wondering about um, the given the longer time course, maybe like a toxic or metabolic etiology or like a like a subclinical infection. Um, and I'm interested to hear more about the the past history and the and and some labs to help me kind of pinpoint where where we might be in in that schema. Uh, amazing. I couldn't agree more with you. I think that um, hitting on the TSH and hitting on um, the depth of the psychiatric symptoms is very, very wise. And I, um, I, uh, I'm curious what you made of the now knowledge that we also know that her upper extremities are involved in um, the symptom complex. What do you think about that? What did that do for you? So I may have missed that. I apologize. So in terms of the upper extremities, oh, okay. yeah. did she have the... I heard you just mention like the writing things, but she, did she notice weakness? I'm just saying, what was the symptom in the upper extremity? She didn't really feel weak. Um, like, you know, I don't, you guys will get the exam in the next hour, call, but like not really weak. Uh, it's just mostly the numbness and tingling. Got it. So I, I thanks, Jazz, and thanks, Robbie, for pointing it out. I, I think that maybe what that's making me think of now is the given that this is happening relatively diffusely and I, I don't hear about any kind of ascending matter, like from the from the lower extremities up to uh, up then to the upper extremities later. I'm wondering more about like a um, like something that's causing potentially a um, like a polyneuropathy that maybe not in a like a in in a in a particular length dependent pattern, but more so in a um, I'm wondering kind of like we were thinking before about like a like a toxin, like a B12 deficiency, a thiamine deficiency, or maybe an infection, uh, and less so like a like any typical presentation of GBS, um, because it seems to be happening relatively diffusely and not in any kind of, um, not in a not in an ascending pattern. Although we may have missed the ascending pattern a little bit earlier. Yeah, no, I I, I think that's such an appropriate label, and I think I have two pieces of advice. Uh, two pieces of advice for everybody here. The first is that if you're starting to get a vibe for a specific kind of entity, be it a uh, encephalitis syndrome or a toxic or a nutritional deficiency, I think the question that you're trying to grapple with in your mind is what do you spend time on talking to this patient? Do you spend time trying to get risk factors uh, for the disease category that you're worried about? Risk factors for encephalitis, risk factors for toxidromes, risk factors for nutritional deficiencies, or do you spend time understanding the clinical syndrome? And I think it's too way too soon to start to focus on risk factors for specific entities. So in real life, if you're spending time asking this patient if she is at risk for uh, nutritional deficiencies or at risk for toxins, I don't think you're spending your time efficiently, in large part because we don't know what the syndrome is quite yet. And so while traditional medicine will teach you to get data in a way that collects risk factors before you allow and understand the disease, and we'll only understand the disease when we examine this patient and then start to trigger an illness script, I would really spend your time now trying to understand what this entity is and then start to look for risk factors for a more concrete case or a more specific problem. Um, so I think what's, what's emerged is now we cannot call this a neuropathy. And that's because, a regular old neuropathy, I mean, we, because it's breaking some of the rules of um, the classic presentation of neuropathy. And the rules are the three S's. Symmetric, which this is. Sensory predominant, which this is. But the final S is broken, slowly progressive. So while this is symmetric and sensory predominant, this is not slowly progressive. And so now this is either not a neuropathy at all or an atypical neuropathy. And if you're working up atypical neuropathies, you'll see that there's so many different categories and diseases to think of. But I'm going to give you a, a helpful way to prioritize the more morbid causes. And it's through a mnemonic, A, B, C. A stands for two things, AIDP, which is Guillain-Barre, and AIP. Um, acute intermittent porphyria. This is not acute intermittent porphyria for many reasons. That's the A. The B are essentially nutritional deficiencies, B1 deficiency, B3 deficiency, B12 deficiency, all the vitamin deficiencies. The C is a reminder to think about cauda equina and to think about um, many of the clostridial toxins that can cause rapidly progressive neuropathy symptoms especially uh, botulism, but also tetanus. 
And then finally, the other category, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, and then other, the big other is uh, heavy metal toxicity and present with a rapidly progressive uh, neuropathy. So I'm now crossing this and saying, crossing that A, B, C, and heavy metal in my mind and saying, what do I need to prioritize? And I think Guillain-Barre needs to be considered in this patient because of the rapidly progressive sensory symptoms, but it's been going on for six weeks. So by definition, it'll not be Guillain-Barre, but maybe Guillain-Barre's um, uh, uh, Guillain-Barre's cousin. Um, could it be nutritional deficiencies? Absolutely. Could it be caught equina? Nope, because the patient has uh, upper extremity involvement. Could it be heavy metal toxicity? Absolutely. So um, I'm really excited for the exam, but I'm paying special attention to what this, what the peripheral signature of this disease process is and to make sure that we think of these things because they're really, really important not to miss. All right, Jess, tell us more, please. I'm like trying my hardest uh, not to give away any clues. That was just both of you phenomenal. Um, all right, so um, past medical history. She, like I said, has history of hypothyroidism um, on levothyroxine. Um, she also has um, depression and anxiety well-controlled with combination of therapy and SSRI. Um, she had a splenectomy 20 years ago. Uh, after a, a motor vehicle accident um, and um, th this year had a uh, left hip arthroplasty. Uh, socially, she probably smokes about five cigarettes a day. Um, so she's a social alcohol drinker. Uh, she likes the hike, but ever since all these symptoms have been happening um, and just other things, she hasn't been active uh, hiking wise in the last three months. Um. In terms of her meds, she like I said, she takes Levo. She, uh, I forget what it was. I think it was fluoxetine that she takes for her depression and slash anxiety. Uh, and that's basically it. She takes a multivitamin um, for her other meds. Um, for vitals. So blood pressure was 120 over 68. Uh, heart rate was 110. Um, afebrile. Uh, basically all of her exam was normal. I can go straight to the neuro exam. Uh, basically she, you, she could tell that the sensation were reduced both, um, into her hands all the way up to maybe about her like mid forearm and then had normal sensation above that. So I would, I would say more proximal, um, and that's bilateral. And with the, when it comes to the lower extremity, she would say the numbness and tingling, uh, would probably come up to, more uh, to like mid shin to maybe closer to the knees. She wouldn't really feel too much numbness and tingling above the knees. In terms of her gait, it was definitely like, you could tell she has some coordination issues, but it was hard to really decipher because her strength wasn't completely normal. Uh, I would say like maybe like four out of five, but probably closer to five out of five. I Based on assessment, it seems like her ataxia or her coordination was probably more sensory related and she just didn't know where to like place her feet and if she was going to be stable or not so i'm going to pause there before i go on to um labs and imaging thanks so much jazz so much really rich information um so i i think that based upon the exam it it, it seems like you're telling us pretty definitively that we're in the sensory space. I guess I'm wondering, you mentioned that it, you felt like her coordination was more so from her, from her sensory neuropathy. Did, did you try like a, I mean, finger knows it, it sounds like you were saying she didn't quite know where her hand might've been in space, but did you try like a, um, like a dysdiatocokinesia kind of measurement or the, did you try any other, any, any other assessment of coordination? Yeah. And, and that's a good question. Uh, but that was all normal. So, uh, no dysdiatocokinesia, but then again, Neuro is my weakest point. So even if I say it didn't see, it seemed more sensory, don't take my word for it. I don't believe you at all that neuro is your weakest point. But anyway, so the, in terms of where we are now, so I think that we now have, um, we have reduced sensation. We have, and we have numbness and tingling that are really distal. I guess they're beyond the, what I'm, it sounded like you said beyond the elbow and, and beyond the, beyond the knee. Um, yeah, sorry. I meant to say distal and I said proximal. That's my fault. Yeah, sorry. Distal. No Thank worries. you for picking that up on. So I think 
so, so I guess when we have a neuropathy, I, I know Manny and some others mentioned in the chat, like the really good ways of trying, trying to break down that neuropathy in terms of how we think about it in terms of uh, like exonal versus demyelinating and ultimately being able to pick that up from a, from something like an EMG, um, which we can't always do when we have somebody in the a patient setting. I, I guess where I am in terms of trying to differentiate this, the, the, like Robbie was saying before the, the exact type of syndrome we're experiencing, whether it seems like we're in the, in the bucket of a, of a sensory neuropathy, but in terms of what type of sensory neuropathy, it could be axonal versus demyelinating. I, I, in, in terms of the time course, like the, and I know Robbie mentioned like some typical versus atypical causes of the, of the sensory neuropathy. I, I think that the fact that this is happening so in, in this subacute space is making me think about more things like, uh, more things like the heavy metal toxicities, but which potentially could, and the, uh, like the uh, variant of an AIDP, a variant of GBS, which I know either one could be, uh, exonal versus demyelinating. I, I don't feel like I have enough exam information just yet. Uh, other than to say that maybe the length dependence is maybe ma making me lean towards an external type, external type rather than demyelinating type in terms of next things I would, I would want to do. I guess I would, I would want to get like, a, I would want to get a CBC to look for a macrocytic anemia, which may cue me towards a, a B12 deficiency. I would want to look at a, a metabolic panel, which might show me, um, evidence of a, like an acute kidney injury or uremia, which could be contributing to neuropathy. And then the following those results, potentially look at things like, a, a like, like a lead level or a B12 level or um, the, and talk to our neurology colleagues to see if we could get any of those tests that we talked about, like a, like a, um, I mean, a, like an EMG or, or a nerve conduction study on the inpatient side. Um, but I think that's where I am right now. What did I miss so far, Robbie? Oh, I love that that's your question. I don't think you missed anything. I think that identifying this as an atypical neuropathy is basically the key finding here. And I completely agree with everything you said. And, and a part of me now is trying to figure out like, okay, since we're getting clarity on this syndrome a little bit more that it is an atypical sensory predominant neuropathy, atypical meaning its distribution and its onset, um, to try to screen the the um, the past medical history and the surgical history and the meds for any uh, uh, risk factors. And so looking at that, does, does anything um, strike you in terms of that potential space that we're seeing? So splenectomy, but I, I appreciate you pointing it out, Robbie. I kind of skipped over the the past medical yeah. surgical history. I think uh, the splenectomy is interesting in terms of thinking about infections. I guess with splenectomy, I mostly <laughs> think about like really hyperacute encapsulated bacterial infections yeah. and also about subclinical infections that could cause a neuropathy. Um, hypothyroidism, and we, we talked a good bit yes. about it, the 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 change in this, per the kind of the sudden change in this person's dose of levothyroxine. And I, I know hypothyroidism in and of itself can lead to a neuropathy sometimes. And I also think about hypothyroidism being associated more with like more, more distal, uh, more distal symptoms on the neuroaxis, like, uh, like, like myopathies. But I, I think that we're pretty safely here in the sensory neuropathy space, which I don't so much associate with, the, with hypothyroidism, but I'm, I'm still wondering yeah. as to why this person might've had that sudden change in, in her levothyroxine dose. And then in terms of the meds, uh, I guess I wonder why they would have been taking, why she would have been taking a multivitamin. Um, and if there might've been yeah. any kind of, uh, GI, is subclinical GI pathology that we may not have diagnosed before that could have predisposed her to a vitamin deficiency. And then the social alcohol drinking, I, if, she, if maybe she suffers from alcohol use disorder, we don't, haven't quite identified that yet. Mm -hmm. Maybe that could predispose her to, um, alcohol related toxicity of the, of the sensory nerves or, um, or vitamin deficiencies, like we mentioned earlier. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Uh, agree with you, and I think that um, uh, those are probably the most practical um, lenses to take. I think her sm smoking history is notable, but probably not enough to start to invoke smoking-related cancers and their perineoplastic effects. I think two things to pay attention to to add to armamentarium are the idea of vitamin toxicities with vitamin B six or pyridoxine. So um, its deficiency, I think, is very well described and experienced by our beloved Reza. When you have a B6 deficiency, often as a result of INH therapy, you can get a neuropathy. But the inverse is also true. You can get pyridoxine toxicity with patients taking excessive pyridoxine, and that causes a sensory predominant um, syndrome, which would be very compatible with this patient is, is uh, experiencing. But even more esoteric than that um, is the idea of a heavy metal toxicity from her medical history. 
So this is a, this is either something you've heard of or you haven't heard of. So when I say that, can you think? Can you see anything on here that may predispose her to heavy metal toxicity? Is that really arthroplasty? Like just... Yeah, have you heard of this before? <laughs> so like depending on what they, I think very esoteric, but depending on what they used, depending on what yes. substance they may have uh, placed in her in her hip, she could yep. leach a heavy metal. Yeah, exactly right. So the 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 con the well described uh, but now not so common issue with hip arthroplasties is when you have metal on metal hip prosthesis. So when both the acetabulum and the femoral head are replaced with cobalt, um, and um, you can get what's called what what essentially results in cobalt toxicity from the metal on metal wearing and leaking of the cobalt. Um, you can augment the case for that by, of course, measuring the cobalt level, but also by looking at the imaging to see if the hip and hip has resulted in mechanical wear and tear. And guess what that syndrome looks like? It's a sensory predominant neuropathy, which often actually disproportionately affects the cranial nerve. So it often affects vision and hearing. So the optic nerve and cranial nerve eight, but other uh, features have been described, but it also has two adjacent really cool features. One of which is an endocrinopathy often resulting in worsening thyroid function, which this patient clearly has, um, but also has a very specific and helpful clue, which is it results in polycythemia. So the triad of cobalt toxicities and neuropathy and endocrinopathy and polycythemia, very unusual finding. And the polycythemia is, has to do with cobalt's trophic effects on the bone marrow, um, functioning like epopoietin. And it actually was um, something that was posited um, and attempted to use in the distant past um, as an EPO replacement to try to use some cobalt to get those red blood cells going. So um, I think those are the things that emerge from the from the medical history, whether or not she's actually taking too much pyridoxine or whether she has too much cobalt from her hip arthroplasty. But the whole, this is the whole point of these things. They're not actionable right now. You need to get much more data, um, including her basic labs, to try to um, assess the risk factors for those things. All righty. Das, the mic is yours. Amazing. Um, all right. So labs. Yeah. So most of our workup started in the outpatient setting because she was seeing her PCP and uh, even um, uh, went to urgent care a couple of times as well. So um, they tested her for Lyme, which was negative, EBV, which was negative. Um, they also sent off um, another TSH, which was improving. Uh, it was uh, it was normal. Um, her CBC, um, her hemoglobin was 18.8, which was elevated. Uh, hematocrit was 56%, which was elevated. Um, very mild leukocytosis of 12.7, um, neutrophil predominant. Um, she had um, normal platelets. She, her metabolic panel, um, her sodium was 134, but then also happened to have a uh, hyperglycemia of one, uh, 377. So then an A1C came back at 7.9%. This was new for her. Um, and then uh, calcium was elevated at 10.6. Potassium initially on admission was 3.5, but when she was admitted, dropped down to as low as 2.4. And her mag was low at uh, 0.9. That same night, she actually had uh, a sustained run of VT, uh, which was attributed to um, electrolytes and that was replaced. Uh, her EKG uh, on admission and on repeat revealed sinus tachycardia. Um, on admission, because she was complaining of shortness of breath, the ED providers got troponins, which actually came back positive, uh, 202 to 216. Um, so the 202 was the zero uh, mark, and then the other one was the three-hour troponin, 216. Um, they gave her, the cons considering she wasn't actually having chest pain, cardiology decided not to give, um, uh, like, a, you know, treat this uh, as like a MI. They did give her aspirin and a statin, but uh, didn't, like, urgently do anything else. They did want an echocardiogram. Um which showed a 65% uh, LVEF and everything else was normal, uh, no ejection, uh, sorry, no uh, valvular issues or anything like that. Um, I, that, and I'll pause there. And this is the last aliquot. 
um, the, for the final diagnosis, but I'm happy to answer if there's like any labs or other things that um, you, I might have did not mention that you guys might be interested in. So I guess the the first thing that jumped out to me, of course, was the was the polycythemia after after obvious discussion, wondering if this thing could be could be cobalt cobalt toxicity. I, in, you mentioned that she had this run of VT that they attributed to her electrolytes. So just uh, looking at what what was written down on the white whiteboard, so I know it looks like the patient had hypomagnesemia, and was there mild hypokalemia too? Is that what I heard? Were there? It was two point four, so it was pretty okay. So significant. So in, in terms of trying to to link the hypokalemia to the to to the presentation thus far, so the I guess I'm th in terms of history we have so far, like the hypo hypothyroidism, really the thyroid replacement and hyperthyroidism. I know sometimes can be linked to um, hypokalemia, and I guess hypothyroidism in and of itself too, but hypokalemia and, and like periodic paralysis, but that's not quite associated with the sensory deficits that we've seen so far. Um, hypo hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia, I guess we can sometimes associate with the, um, the, we can sometimes associate those with like a refeeding syndrome and like, could this patient have had a, and really more with thiamine replacement than with thiamine deficiency. Um, and in terms of this, this troponin leak that we have so far, I guess I'm mostly associating that with demand ischemia and not so much with um, the an incredible clue to to the pathology. So I think where I am right now um, is that we've ruled out some of our causes of, of peripheral neuropathy with the with the negative Lyme test, with the negative EBV. Um, given what I what I learned from Robbie just a few minutes ago about about cobalt toxicity, I'd, I'd probably want to get a, a cobalt level. Or at least I'd want to look up how best to to check for cobalt toxicity in this, or or to see a little bit more about this patient's previous hip replacement to see if the, that uh, um, that prosthetic joint could have been placed in an area when uh, when cobalt toxicity could have happened. Um, and then maybe in addition to that, I'd want to look for uh, maybe like maybe a lead level. Um, the we don't. I don't think we have an MCV, so maybe I'd want to see the MCV from the CBC to see if we have any clues towards B12 deficiency. Although, like we said, this seems to be more of a um, like an axonal type neuropathy than a than a demyelinating polyneuropathy that would be which would be more suggestive of B12 deficiency. Um, and then otherwise, in terms of other clues that we had before, I think that's what I'm thinking for now. But uh, I'll keep thinking. What, uh, Ravi? What else were you thinking so far? You know, Alex, it's amazing to see, um, you know, you identified early that you hadn't heard of this entity called to cobalt toxicity, uh, which I'll make an argument for would be my operating hypothesis for now. And then once you get that level and if it's negative, we'll start to think about other things. Um, but I think what's really cool about this case is, and watching you think about this case is you like you're saying, I've never heard of that or, or like I've kind of like vaguely heard about that in the past. I know some about it, but my confidence level on it is not high. And um I would love for you all to, um, if you're in a similar situation, to watch how Alex is using clinical reasoning to make tremendous progress in this case with a knowledge gap. And the truth is that um, uh, even if cobalt toxicity is the ultimate diagnosis and the final diagnosis here, um, the first time that I encountered cobalt toxicity, I was thinking about, I don't remember when that first instance was, but I was in the exact same position as Alex was. And I for sure did not get the diagnosis because it's impossible to get the diagnosis and make a diagnosis of a condition that you've never heard of before, right? So I just want to draw caution to the idea that, um, that um, growth in medicine is happening um, when you already know something. I think who's going to learn and the person who's going to learn and grow from this or the opportunity to learn and grow from this is a person who hasn't heard of this entity before and take advantage of that learning and growth. And the way to do that is exactly what Alex was doing. You're extracting so much juice out of this case and making so many powerful hypotheses that ultimately either by exclusion of those hypotheses or targeted searching of the combination of things you'll see, you'll get to the answer. My goal with this reflection is, is to help try to distill that clinical reasoning and try to il uh, illuminate a pattern 
Because if you see that pattern early on, you're much more likely to go targeted for it. And that pattern, I think, actually emerged in the first aliquot, which is that you have a combination of a brain issue and a nerve issue. And believe me, I'm just sharing, there's no evidence for this. There's no data for this, unfortunately. Um, and a neurologist sharing their thinking with you is going to be of much higher quality. But the truth is, as somebody who takes care of internal medicine patients in the emergency room and urgent care, I have to think about this problem a lot, even without sometimes without any neurological input, because um, they don't have the bandwidth to consult on a patient who's not critically ill in the ER. So you have to ask yourself, what, what kind of process can involve the brain and involve the nerves in a subacute pattern like this? And I think the most powerful filter to realize is many things can affect the brain. Many, many things. Cancers can go there. Infections can go there. But I think what restricts the differential is the nerve involvement. If you think about it, like vast majority of peripheral neuropathies that we see are one of five things. They're either idiopathic, alcohol-related, obesity-related, diabetes-related, or they're familial. And when we think of the systemic diseases that affect the nerves, they're super rare. Some autoimmune diseases, very rare infections. Most of them... Most of them are either idiopathic demyelinating diseases, paraprotein-related diseases, nutritional diseases, and toxins. And so when you're like, oh, man, I have a fancy smancy neuropathy here. Is it demyelinating? Is it toxic metabolic? Is it nutritional? And then very rarely, is it perineoplastic? Is it familial? Is it due to an autoimmune disease? And when you have vibes of the basal ganglia being affected by the psychiatric symptoms, you should really prioritize nutritional deficiencies and toxidromes. So I have yet to get a counter lesson in the uh, combo of I'm feeling irritated and off and I'm not feeling right, basal ganglia, and I have numbness and tingling. To me, that association has been very productive to think about toxidromes and to think about nutritional deficiencies. Enough to really like pay attention to the history of the left hip arthroplasty, which we would ignore in ninety nine percent of people who come in with a neurological symptom who have a hip problem, right? But how can you start to simplify heavy metal toxicity syndromes? And that's the goal, of the teaching that I'm trying to going to try to impart. Is there are so many different heavy metal toxicity syndromes, over ten of them, but they all have a common denominator. And all of them have unique features to the heavy metal. What's the common denominator for almost all of them? Three things. Basal ganglia symptoms or even MRI findings. An atypical neuropathy defined as a neuropathy that's not symmetric sensory predominant or slowly progressive. And then finally, renal tubular acidosis. Those three things you'll find in the vast majority of heavy metal syndromes. Copper excess, renal tubular acidosis, neuropathy. Lead excess, renal tubular acidosis, neuropathy, basal ganglia. Arsenic toxicity, thallium toxicity, many of them do it. What's unique to lead is the microcytic anemia and the constipation. What's unique to arsenic is the rash, the coronary artery disease, and... Um, uh, and the devastating cardiac consequences. What's unique to hemochromatosis? Again, the hyperpigmentation um, and the cardiac involvement. What's unique to cobalt? It's really three other things. The endocrinopathy, which we talked about, the polycythemia, which we talked about, then finally the cardiac complication. So it's really hard not to look at this case and be like, I have the core features of heavy metal. I've got the basal ganglion involvement. I got the nerve involvement. And then finally, the, the uh, hypokalemia, and the hypomagnesemia without diarrhea, without nausea, vomiting, without medications, make me wonder whether this person has a renal electrolyte handling problem. So you get the core, you got the core down. And then what's, what are the accompanying features? The accompanying features are an endocrinopathy with a hypothyroidism and then the polycythemia. So for me, um, cobalt toxicity is such a rare diagnosis that it should not be um, a diagnosis you lock in. For sure, you should never do that. But there are two next steps in this patient that can help you clinch a potentially rare disease, which is to look at the hip and to see if there's degeneration of the heavy, heavy metal prosthesis, if it's broken down, giving you a mechanism for the cobalt release, and then, of course, a cobalt level. Um, and so um, that's what I would do next. And I think there are many other pathways beyond that if that test is negative. 
Um, but I'll pause there to see what questions or thoughts, Alex, you've had a chance to accumulate since I know you have to go in minus 10 seconds. No, no worries at all. The, I guess other questions I'm accumulating were the, I don't know that I ever saw a bicarb. I, I apologize if you read it out and I didn't hear it. Was the, did, did this patient have a, a low bicarb? Bicarb was normal. And then I think you asked mm. about MCV. MCV was also normal. So then... uh, that's a really good point about renal tubular acidosis. Sorry, I, I misspoke. I think what 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 is probably better to, better more precise to say is renal electrolyte handling because one other way that heavy metals can cause electrolyte issues is to actually affect the loop of Henle and to induce what is like a barter or Gittleman like issue. So the term renal tubular acidosis is too specific. It's essentially le renal electrolyte handling. Thank you for pointing that out. Appreciate it. Other questions? I'm sure I'll accumulate more later. I guess I'm a. Uh, I'm really excited to hear the final diagnosis, and I'm hoping that ah. I can hear it before I have to before I have to run. Yeah, <laughs> go for it, Jeff. All right, um, Robbie and Alex, I honestly was like, first of all, I didn't want to stump you guys because I, I okay, it's one of those things where i want you guys to get the diagnosis but the amount of teaching you both implemented i'm so glad i presented this case because i learned a lot um and robbie honestly you're you're an inspiration that's all i have to say patients cobalt level came back at 592 when the uh, upper limit of normal is less than 10 Chrom uh, chromium level came back at 62.4, which is supposed to be less than 0.3. So patient actually had chromium and cobalt toxicity secondary to that left hip arthroplasty that actually, had. I didn't tell you guys a date because I didn't want you guys to anchor on it. It actually happened in June of this year. So it was, and it actually, so, so I have some teaching points and some discourse as well here. So x-ray was done of the left hip when the, when the surgeon suspected this. Um, and that hip x-ray was normal. So he actually took her, into, and when that level came back, he took her into the OR and there was erosion on that metal to metal uh, into the bone, which was leaking, which was leaching uh, uh, all that chromium and cobalt into the circulation. Um, so what I, and I was talking to the toxicologist this whole time and, and um, I was just trying to like learn on this case because I have never seen this case. I've heard about it. I've heard mostly about uh, cobalt uh, induced uh, non ischemic cardiomyopathy, but that happens years later down the road. That very rarely will present acutely. Uh, in fact, no documented cases of acute cardiomyopathy. It's usually years. Um, and the reason why uh, cardiology wanted to get the echo is because of the weird troponin situation and, and, and the VTAC, but that was more for the electrolytes. They think that was the low K and the uh, low um, mag. What led to that? Uh, multifactorial one was uh, um, now after Robbie saying it was probably like the, the disturbance at the loop of Hanuel. But the other thing is she, when she started feeling better after chelation, uh, which I'll get into in a second, uh, she started eating more. And because she had the anorexia, Alex, you mentioned it, a little bit of refeeding because her FOSS was low too. Um, so uh, it could have been a mixture of both the targeting of the loop of Hanuel plus refeeding. Um, the toxicologist told me that there's really no great evidence of like what works the best for these type of things. Um, but they said that, uh, you know, we normally go with his neck or end the cysteine for chelation. Um, there have been some like very various case reports where they say IV thiamine also helps. Um, so patient got IV thiamine um, and then also uh, got end the cysteine. But the main thing is... <clears throat> you have to remove the source. Um, majority of cobalt uh, and apparently chromium toxicity happens via ingestion. But in this case, uh, if it's not, it's usually implants. So it's usually ortho, uh, like your hip joints, and bigger joints are more likely, but you can get them from dental implants. Um, and then, so when the surgeon re removed, kind of like uh, did some of the revision, um, he had to order new parts. So she still had to have it in there, but just the, um, revision alone plus the chelation within days her polycythemia just got better and her electrolyte stabilized she started getting more energy she's her numbness and tingling were still there on discharge but she did could she was able to say that 
it was improved from prior. It was very impressive to see, like just within days of how well she just, you know, improved from that. A um, couple other teaching points. Um, Cobalt, Robbie stole like all of them, but <laughs> just you know, key repetition, I guess. Um, cobalt uh, actually is associated with polycythemia. Um, and in fact, in the olden days, it was used as a treatment for anemia. Um, but now they obviously stop because, Robbie also mentioned this, because a lot of these will lead to hypothyroidism. Um, and uh, so that's why, so if you, there was clues along the whole case, her thyroid, even though she was taking the levothyroxine was still going down, uh, her TSH is still going down. Um, and then, um, basically, uh, you know, um, with the anemia, uh, you know, uh, the polycythemia. And the other thing is, uh, they used to think that, uh, people used to initially get cobalt toxicity from drinking beer. Um, because they used to use as a foam stabilizer. A lot of people find uh, beer with a lot of foam as like more attractive or more uh, appetizing. And they used to use cobalt as a foam stabilizer. So there's a, plenty of case reports of cobalt toxicity in people who used to drink a lot of beer. So yeah, main take home is like uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy from cobalt is years down the road. Um, but with her like presentation, they, they checked an echo just to be in the safe end and plus to have a baseline. Uh, but this case just taught me so much. And Robbie and Alex, you guys crushed it. Just want to highlight, um, Hugh, Hugh Ting in the chat mentioned lead poisoning very early on. And then Alex, in your first eloquat, you said heavy metal toxicity. So you guys were, you guys all did amazing. I'm very impressed. Thank you so Alex, much. I know you have to go. Just tell us how it feels. Um, I, I, I'm really curious to get a sense of how you're feeling and um, no, I was just, yeah. I was going to apologize that I, that I do have to run, but I, I again, yeah. I really appreciate you guys letting me step into the, to the discussion seat. Um, and it was, a it was, it was so much fun hanging out with everybody this morning or this early afternoon, I guess, depending on what time it is, but I, I think that seat is, yeah, the seat has been waiting for you for a long, not to cut you off. I know you have to go. No, I just have to tell you that like the seat has been waiting for you for a long time. I can't wait for you to come back. And I think that everybody here really just appreciates how dental you are, how deep your knowledge base is, how humble you are, and how precise you are with your learning. And I think we're really, really inspired by it. And and um, yeah, I think you should try to listen to this at least one more time to be like, wait, hold on. I said heavy metal toxicity in the first minute and a half of this case, and it turns out to be the case. And to pair with that. Lucky guess. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's a lucky guess, but I agree with you. And I share your sentiment and I share the sentiment everybody has here is we all have a lot left to learn. And um, for me, my, I, I had no idea that chromium was involved in this, like absolutely no idea. And so excited to, um, to reflect on that. But I, I don't want to keep you any longer than you have to go. I will fill you in on, um, on David's uh, excellent teaching points. And I'm excited for, for round two. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, yes, Robbie, Jeff. Just quick, yeah, very quickly. Oh, take your time. Take your time. I just wanted to make sure he was able to go. And now we can um, go no, at whatever I, pace you need. No, so I, I asked about the chromium toxicity and the yeah. toxicologist was like, yeah, I want you to send it out. But honestly, there's very, very, if there's less literature on cobalt, there's even lower amount of literature on chromium Interesting. toxicity. And he was basically saying that he wonders if the tinnitus or the tinnitus is from the chromium, yeah. but mm. um, he's he wasn't mm. sure, but he thinks that the, he, so he thinks it's very hard to, obviously there's some factors here that's like, okay, this is definitely cobalt. But from yeah. what his experience was, chromium has to be very high, like it has to be a, like a pretty big intoxication for it to have symptoms. And it's usually it's very nonspecific, like that malaise, GI disturbances. Mm -hmm. But he goes, the one thing that he's seen is pulmonary edema from chromium toxicity and um, to, uh, like um, vis uh, hearing uh, type of symptoms. Interesting. Yeah, That's really, really uh, cool. And uh, can you enlighten us on a couple of things? I, I learned so much from, from your reflection, the first of which is, to realize that the so it sounds like the degeneration of the prosthesis was only appreciated in the OR, not appreciated on imaging. Is that right? Wow. Yes, but the one caveat is we did not get a CT scan. Um, I see. Yeah. By the way, you know how this case like how so the patient um, googled her symptoms and went to Whoa. the surgeon and was like, "Hey, do you think this could be cobalt?" That's amazing. Toxicity? So um, power, yeah. So it's like the patient advocated That's for so himself. Cool. Because wow. it was 
like even yeah. no 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 one really initially knew what was going on so when she came yeah. to the hospital like i yeah. i was the main i was the attending for her case but like mm -hmm. the the diagnosis at that time was already in like known so. that's amazing I'm so glad for her and her ability to advocate for herself. It certainly goes a long, long way. That's really, really cool. I had um, one other question for you that slipped my mind now. I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, you taught, taught us about the prosthesis and, um, oh gosh, maybe it'll come back to me. I'll just ask you offline later, but I really, really thank you for the, presenting this case. I think that, um, you know, when you're sitting and you're watching um, somebody who who's presenting, I was you, you, I was like, why is Das telling us telling us about the TSH? Is that a distractor? Is it not? Why is he like um, uh, telling us about all these things? And at the end of the day, um, you, you that setup turns out to be really, really key. But it, you did such a good job of painting the picture of this disease without um, making it seem as if it was an obvious answer. In large part by mentioning the splenectomy and mentioning the motor vehicle accident and mentioning the smoking history, mentioning the alcohol. And I think that's the art of setting up a case presentation for such a great discussion and a great conversation between everybody here is to make sure you in include all the key tips, not to overemphasize their existence. You were like, oh, yeah, I'm just some thyroid issues and we changed her dose, but to also not um, not dilute all the other accompanying features that a person has to really allow us to tell the story, which was really, really cool and really, really appreciate that. Um, you're a master at this. And uh, for all of you who are tracking Jas's incredible presentations, he's got I can count three so far. I don't know if you've had more. Have you had more? I count three. Two before you joined, including the contrast encephalopathy and now this. Um, but I know there's a fourth coming on RLR uh, in uh, 10 days from now. So you better, uh, if, you, if you're free, you should totally join. Uh, any final pieces of advice um, and reflections, Josh, on this case before we get to do round two of the learning with David? No, I just, like, for those... First of all, I think everyone knows who Robbie is, but I, it's impressive how how well you just take symptoms and break them down and 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 and, and teach in a in a bite sized uh, piecemeal fashion. I think it's a gift, and there's a lot of people that take that gift and they keep it to themselves. And you are, here you are on a platform sharing it with everyone for free of cost, and I think it's more people need need to be like this but um um it's an honor to be a part of this whole VMR family and, and CPS Fauna family for sure so uh, as many as cases I, I'll keep keep bringing I'll keep bringing it but I, to be honest the the joy is is hearing the discussion from the VMR and the CPS and by the way kudos to the chat there were all great ideas as well Oh, that's real kind of you. And I appreciate you sharing that. I think what the cost of people's time and effort is huge, you know, in a time and space when you can do so many different things, that's not lost upon me and anybody else in CPS that people are choosing to watch this on YouTube, choosing to be here, choosing to spend some time putting the cases together, choosing to think about this. And I really, really appreciate that. And yeah, I think, you know, as I've said to you privately, I think the person who's benefited the most from this community is me. I get to hang out and surround myself with the most brilliant people and most motivated people in the world. And if you listen to VMR number one and listen to my discussion and you listen to it now, you'll notice a small but very tangible difference. And so that is only happening because of the people that I'm surrounded by. So it is a, uh, it's a ping ball effect where we all get to elevate each other. And uh, I'm really, really thrilled to have that opportunity. All right, David, take us home, please. Okay, so thank you very much Jack, for the case and uh, well, the your discussion. Uh, Ravi and, and Alex, and it's uh, it's unbelievable how how can you get to that diagnosis? I think well, it's it's incredible. Um, I I will just uh uh three three teaching points and just uh, if not it's going to be a, a bit uh, long, but um I like it a lot, uh, especially the, the the fact of uh, psychiatric symptoms having um uh, making us think in frontal lobe disease and, and especially in basal ganglia uh, disease and making these um, basal ganglia problems related to alcohol, uh, heavy metal and vitamin deficiencies. Uh, all of these which would also uh, cause uh, neuropathies. Um, the, the fact that uh, most neuropathies uh, follow the three S's, they are symmetric, uh, slowly progressive, and sensory predominant, but 
that in this case, uh, the, the case was not uh, concordant with the slowly progressive nature of most uh, neuropathies. And we have to think in, in other atypical neuropathies, such as the, the, the ones that are given by this mnemonic that uh, Ravi shared about uh, ABC, A, uh, in ADP and um, doing GMRA and, and his cousins, and also um, porphyria, B, uh, being B, B deficiencies, and also B6 deficiency or, or excess, C, including other equine and clostridial toxins, and the heavy metal toxicity was uh, was this case um, and um, given given the final uh, DX, uh, I I like you to to share also the the, the three main um, common features of of heavy metal toxicity toxicities, which are uh, the basal ganglia symptoms or or MRI findings, the atypical neuropathies uh, and the and the tubulopathies or renal electrolyte uh, problems, all of them, which was uh, present in, in this case. So uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And well, I am missing, I'm missing this question. Mary, you like literally took the essence of this case and represented it to us and, and the ability to see what the key learning points are and psych symptoms, atypical neuropathies, cobalt toxicity. That was amazing. Really, really nice job. All right, y'all. Thank you, Jeff, again for uh, an amazing case, and David for the teaching points, and Ashutosh sli silently scribing away a really, really complicated case. I think it's clear to see how much more comfortable you're getting time by time by time. Um, we hope to see you tomorrow. It's going to be a really, really fun session. Um, the legendary Maddie is presenting a case, um, and it'll be uh, myself and Reza taking on uh, taking on our friend and 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 enemy uh, ChatGPT. So it'll be around two of that. Um, and Nara will probably be there too. <laughs> Hope to see you then. Bye.